Sing, we're marching to Zion, all right? And now we'll be singing, uh, I shall know him after that. But for now, we're marching to Zion. Of the nails in 
Bibles and turn with me. This is a starting point today in Isaiah 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Oh, ladies, you have, uh, you have something for you guys downstairs. You guys want to have all the ladies. Yes. So good. So good. things. 
And we live in a world of fairy tales, and we live in the world of the tooth fairy, and we live in a world today where there's the superhero craze, and I'm not trying to knock all these things or uh, fun traditions that we have at home, but this is the type of world that we live in, and we have all these fantasies, and we have all these fairy tales, so then people take God's word, and they take the Christmas story, and they take Jesus Christ, and they say, well, that's a fairy tale too. But we need to strain things out. We need to draw the line. We need to look at God's word and find truth. And sometimes we need a reality check. We need to go back and look at scripture and say, what is truth? So as you consider this, and uh, for time's sake, I'm hoping to try to get through this quickly. We're going to look at the truth and then we're going to consider what do we do with this truth. So first of all, I want you to notice the truth of his birth. The truth of his birth. You know, there are those who are still waiting for the first coming of the Messiah. Mm-hmm. People are still, they deny Jesus, they did not deny that he's the Son of God, and they're waiting for the Messiah to come and save them, but he's already come. That's right. There are those who say that Jesus didn't walk the earth. There are those who say Jesus was a prophet, a great teacher, but he wasn't God. But we see throughout the scripture several things. Uh, we see that he was God in the flesh. In Matthew 1, 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That was part of the verse that Marco read for us this morning. And we see the name itself, Emmanuel, which is given to us even in the Old Testament, means God with us, God to come to us in the flesh. John 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, And the Word was God, in verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That is God coming to us in the flesh. We see in uh, Isaiah 9, 6, this uh, child who was born (laughs) unto us, and the the names that are, are given to him, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. This is speaking about the Trinity of God and God himself. In the, in, as God the Son came to us in the flesh. Philippians 2.5, uh, a, a very familiar portion of scripture, and uh, this is something that I studied recently in the last couple of years, and one of those things that kind of blew my mind when I started looking at the Greek and things like that, but it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So this passage is literally saying that God, Jesus Christ, who's equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took on the form of flesh, took on the form of man, and was born and came to this earth. And when you study out the Greek, you see what the Greek is saying is that he's literally 100% God and 100% man at the same time. But that's what he did for us. He put on that flesh and he came to this earth. So he was God in the flesh. We also see that he was born king. Jesus Christ came to this earth and he was born as king. In John 18, 37, when Pilate is, he's standing before Pilate. And Pilate says, art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Matthew 2.2 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Jeremiah 23.5 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, And a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And there's many other verses. Even in the genealogy at the beginning of Matthew, we see that Jesus Christ was born of the royal line as a son of David and uh, from Abraham as well. So he was born, or he was God in the flesh, he was born king, and he was born to be sacrificed. He was born to be sacrificed. And that's one of those things when you think about it. God coming in the form of a baby. And that very baby who came to this earth was born to die. When you think about that. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about a child being born, 
and he hold a newborn baby. And I know we're a group of men here. I don't know how many of you guys have held a baby recently. But not too long ago, I held a newborn baby and the innocence of that child. But to think, for to hold a child and knowing that child was born to die is a very sobering thought. Mm -hmm. But that is the reality of Christmas. At this time, when we consider the truth, that is the truth of the birth of Jesus Christ, that he was born to be a sacrifice for our sins, born to die on the cross. Matthew 1, And he shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So God ordained this, and his plan for our, our salvation, he was born to be sacrificed. So we see his birth, the truth of his birth. But as well, we see the truth of his love. The tr truth of his love. And letter A was from the beginning. You can go back to Genesis and you can look at the love of God and the plan of our salvation. In Genesis 3.15, we see it prophesied that one day God would defeat, Jesus Christ would defeat Satan. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And we see the picture here of the serpent is uh, Satan, and the bruising of his, uh, the head, and we see this picture of Jesus Christ crushing the head of the serpent, and the salvation that is brought to us, the victory that is won through Jesus Christ. In Genesis 12, 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So we see his love is pictured right from the beginning, and the truth that is seen there. You know, this past weekend, or uh, on Friday, I was uh, sharing uh, a very thorough gospel message, and just somebody who had knowledge of the Word of God, they had knowledge of the New Testament, they had knowledge of uh, even parts of the Old Testament, and yet still... They, they shared with me, they said, for 10 to 15 years, I've been asking these questions, and I can never get a, a correct answer. And I showed her right from the beginning how God's love is shown to us right from Genesis, and all Scripture <clears throat> points to Jesus Christ. And that's what we see in Scripture, and it's pictured right from the beginning, and His love was from the beginning. We see His love is pictured throughout Scripture. Throughout different passages, we see the pictures of of Jesus Christ and his love for us, his redemption for us. We see it in Adam and Eve. We see it in the story of Cain and Abel. We see it with Abraham and Isaac. We see it with the Passover lamb. We see it with the, the, the Jewish boys that were captive uh, and thrown in the fiery furnace. We see it with Daniel who was thrown into, into the lion's den. We see all these stories where we see Jesus Christ being pictured, his love for us being pictured as our Redeemer. Job 19.25 says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the late, uh, latter day upon the earth. So we see a picture throughout Scripture. And as we consider the reality of his love, we see the reality of his sacrifice as well. And the fact that he was willing to sacrifice himself. John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And he says, Ye are my friends. Jesus Christ himself telling us that he was willingly there to sacrifice himself for us. Isaiah 53, 7, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. So as, as sinners, or as an unsaved sinner, our human minds can't comprehend this kind of love that Jesus Christ shows to us. And many people who are unsaved think, and they look at their lives, and they look at how depraved their life has been, and how far gone and sin they are, and they, they think, I can't be saved. There's no God that would willingly save me or forgive me of my sins. And yet still, that what, that's what Jesus Christ did for us. We weren't too far from sin, and he came for us in our sinful state to die on the cross for us. 
And that's the grace that God shows us. That he'd be willing to die for us in our sinful state. So we see the truth of his birth. We see the truth of his love. But we also see the truth of his gift. The truth of his gift. The cost of his gift we see in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is something that is freely given and only needs to be received as gift. And the cost of that gift was Jesus Christ on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we need to receive that gift. And of course, at this time of year, as we uh, prepare for Christmas and we go around and we're buying people gifts, we go to the store, and you know what? There's a cost for that gift. And many of the times, not always, but many of the times, we're willing to pay that price for that gift because of the person you love. You say, this is the thing I want to get for them, to show my love to them. I'm willing to pay the cost for that. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. He looked at us in our sinful states, and he says, I love you. And despite the cost of this sacrifice, despite the cost of this gift, I'm willing to pay the price to pay the price for your sins and die upon the cross. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that sobering to think about that? Amazing to try to comprehend just even a little bit of God's love for us that he would do that for us. Mm. So we see the truth of his gift, that the cost of it. We also see the recipient of the gift. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And aren't you thankful that God's gift is for all men? It's for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right. We can receive that gift. So we see this truth given to us throughout Scripture. And I can go on and on and give you Scripture after Scripture that show us the love of God for us, that show us the sacrifice that He gave for us and the gift that He's given to us. But I want to flip the script now as we consider if you're here today and you're a believer, you're saved, and you say, I've prayed, I've called upon the name of the Lord, I've accepted him as Savior, I know that one day heaven is my home, and now here we are, we're living on this earth, and we're trying to serve him, we're trying to please him. And we know that we have the truth of God's word. So let me ask you, when God has done so much for us, and we see what he's given to us, what do we give back to God? When we look at the truth of God's word and we, we consider the truth of God dying for us in our sinful state, what do we do with that truth? Do we just kind of sit on it and live our own life and try to uh, please ourselves and we try to just focus on ourselves? Or do we try to give back to God? Do we try to live for Him? Do we take that truth and we, do we obey and follow God's word. You know, when you consider the story of Christmas, and last week at the potluck I shared about the shepherds, uh, but one of the other uh, um, characters I want to consider just very quickly as we consider this, uh, taking the truth and applying it, is Joseph. As we gather here as a group of uh, men upstairs today, let us consider the story of Joseph. And his role in the birth of Jesus. And of course we know the birth of Jesus it involved many characters. But they all took a backstory, a, ba a background role. And, but here you see Joseph who's engaged to Mary. And takes on the role as the father of Jesus. Yet still we see so much in the story of, Je or of, of Joseph having faith. And following God, all based upon truth and understanding God's truth. So if you have your Bibles, I want to read another passage. And we'll read a couple of passages just as we quick, uh, quickly consider this. In Matthew 1, verse 18. Matthew 1, 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to 
make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. So imagine being Joseph. You're engaged to be married, and you find out that she is pregnant. And you're wondering, what are people going to think? What am what are we going to do? And he's already considering uh, putting her away, and uh, he, he doesn't want to shame her, even though uh, in those days, the women were not, uh, they, they weren't given very much value. So in that situation, you could bring shame to, to your wife's name. But Joseph in love is saying, I'm going to do this quietly. I'm just going to walk away from the situation. And he's considering all these things before God steps in and sends the angel and speaks to him and tells him what he needs to do. And I like what it says in verse 24. And we're going to notice this pattern with Joseph. As he rose from his sleep, it says he did as the angel of the Lord had bidden to him. He just did it. He followed God's word. He followed God's command. He took the truth that was there and followed him. You know, oftentimes in our lives when we go through situations or we get blindsided by something, it's so easy for us to be overcome by emotions. And your mind is spinning. Your mind's running through all the options. And you're trying to think about what you're going to do. And often in those times, that's where Satan's lies are going to take over. Because you're going to not be focused on God's truth. Or your emotions are going to take over. Or all these things. Or perception of other people. What they think are going to take over. But we need to rely upon God's truth and his word. Joseph could have ignored God's word. And he could have focused and said, well, this doesn't make sense. It makes sense. It doesn't add up. I'm not the father. So it must be someone else. And Think about what all the people are going to think and say and what's going to happen. And he could have just gone on with his plan, divorced her, and walked away. But you know what he did? He took truth. Mm. Truth. God's word grounded him, and he obeyed and followed God's truth. And we need to do the same thing in our lives. Joseph obeyed God in faith. Mm. And in our lives, when things are unsettled, when there's uncertainties, when we're blindsided... We need to ignore the lies. We need to ignore our emotions. We need to ignore all the things that we are capable of doing and obey God in faith based upon his truth because we can stand firm on God's word. So J Joseph obeyed God in faith. But as well, Joseph followed in faith. He followed him in faith. Look with me at Matthew 2.13. Matthew 2.13 <coughs> So the story continues, and uh, Jesus is born. And it says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared, appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt. So once again, God in his providence and care comes on to Joseph and he warns him and tells him, hey, Herod is after Jesus because he wants to be the only king. He doesn't want to share the throne and he's going to start killing children under, under the age of two to try to destroy Jesus. So God sends a message to Joseph, says, get up and go. And you know what Joseph did? He caught up and went. Mm -hmm. He took his family, and he followed God. He went to Egypt. And you know what the amazing thing about the story is that God told him to go to Egypt, and you know what he says in verse 13? Flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. <laughs> he didn't say go to Egypt and stay there for three weeks. 
He said, go and stay there until I give you another word. Go there and trust me. Go there and stay there until I give you further instruction. You know what that takes? That takes faith to follow God. Sometimes we want the whole plan laid out before us. We want to see from A to Z. God, how are you going to lay this out? But God literally said, go and wait for me. You know, we need to do the same thing in our lives. Our lives have uncertainty, uncertainty, uh, uncertainties. We have uh, things that come up in our lives. And sometimes we don't even foresee what's happening. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, maybe they didn't know what was coming down the line with Herod. And what if they had stayed there? But God foresaw what was happening and warned them. You know, sometimes God in our lives and his providence and care for us, he guides us and leads us along and says, hey, I need you to move. I need you to follow me there. And you're saying, well, God, what, what comes after that? What's the next step? And he says, don't worry about that yet. Follow me now. Go here. It's for your goodness. It's for your, for my, it's my care for you. Just follow me. And the truth is that isn't always easy because that takes patience. That takes trust. But when you consider Joseph and his faith that he had in him, he, he got to this point where he said, I can trust God's word. Mm-hmm. I can trust his direction in my life. And when we build our life and we stand firm on God's word, even though there's uncertainty, even though we don't see what's after this next step, we can know that we can trust God's word. And we can also look back on our lives at the time that God did lead us, and we can say, look... <laughs> I know God's going to continue to lead me because he's led me in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's what Joseph did. He followed in faith. Now look with me at uh, Matthew 19 as we see Joseph return in faith. Or sorry, not Matthew 19. Matthew 2, verse 19. Matthew 2, verse 19. It says, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought uh, the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that uh, Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So once again, God goes to Joseph in the stream through the angel and speaks to him and says, Rise up, arise and go. Return to Israel. And sure enough, Joseph, he wakes up and they go. They leave. He follows God in faith and returns to Israel. And you say, well, that's, that, that's kind of easy. But it, I don't know if you notice in this passage, in verse 22, he did arise and he followed in faith, but when he heard that Archelaus did reign in the room of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go thither. He went, but he was afraid. But you know what? His fear didn't stop his faith in God. And sometimes... Maybe he got comfortable. Maybe they went to Egypt and they were fine there and they knew they were safe. But God said, return, go back. Now, this time of waiting is over, go back. And he went, and yet still he was afraid. But if you notice, it says, notwithstanding the warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the heart of Galilee. He remembered, he said, God has been leading me so far and I can continue to follow him. You know, men, no matter how great our fears and challenges that we may face in our lives, or what journey God is taking us on, the direction he's leading us in, we need to remember God has been faithful to us throughout our journey. He's Mm -hmm. going to continue to be faithful in leading us. And despite the fact that we might look at the circumstances around where God is leading us, We don't need to let our fear overcome our faith. Joseph looked and he said, look, Herod's son is reigning. Do you think he's not going to kill us? 
But he said, but God said the go, so I'm going to go. Mm. And that's what we need to do. We need to follow God's leading in our lives. We need to follow his direction. And once again, Joseph, what is he doing? He's resting in God's truth. He's resting in his word. He says, God led me this far. He sent me to Egypt. He, he, he told me to not put away my wife. He told me to marry uh, 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 my, my fiance and to continue on. And he kept leading me and leading me, and he's going to keep leading me on. Man, I don't know. Maybe you're in one of these scenarios where you're just like, I need to follow God, but it's hard. Rest in God's truth. Don't, don't let your emotions take over. Don't let your heart take over. You know, the Word of God tells us that our, heart, our, my, our hearts are deceitful. Don't let Satan get in our ears and try to deceive us and try to lead us astray because he doesn't want us to obey God's word. He doesn't want us to follow. He'll make things seem like, okay, I can do this on my own. I can make this right. But as soon as we do that, we fall on our face and we don't follow God's leading. We need to follow God's leading in our lives and rest in his truth. So what are you doing with God's truth today in your life? Are you obeying him? Are you following his lead? Are you resting in his promises? One of the things that I love about Joseph is that here's Joseph, and he's in this leadership position in his household. He's the father. He's the husband. But yet still, he's following in faith. He's following God. And he's taking a background picture to Jesus Christ. He's staying out of it. He's, I'm not going to get in God's way. I'm going to follow him. Mm. And I think sometimes we forget that we're not the main character of our own life. Mm, that's true. We're not the main focus. In our lives, in all of our stories, Jesus Christ is always the focus. That's right. He's the main focus because he died for our sins and wants us to be saved. So if you're here today and you've never taken a moment, you've never come to a place in your life where you call upon God's name and prayed and made him your savior, that's your purpose. That's God's plan for you today is to be saved. And if you're saved today and you're a believer of Jesus Christ, he's still the main character. We need to follow him. Mm -hmm. He's given to us, so now we need to give back to him. We need to follow his truth, follow his word, and let him take first place in our lives. Right. That means we need to surrender our desires we need to, to surrender our own interpretations of things. We need to surrender our emotions. We need to surrender all that we have and let God take per, first place in our lives. Allow Him to lead us. And as we allow Him to lead us, you know what's going to happen? We're going to lead our families properly. We're going to lead our, lead our wives. We're going to lead our, our children. And we're going to do it the way God intended us to lead well. Because we put him first place in our lives. So as we consider God's truth, we consider Joseph, I hope today that you have a better understanding of God's truth for us today. And that you don't just take it and sit upon it, but that you apply it to your lives and allow God's truth to work in your lives. Today. So let's pray as we close. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're grateful for the truth that is found in your word and that we can rest upon it. And despite the world that we live in and the, the lies that are floating around and um, <clears throat> people who are seeking truth and they're seeking hope and they don't know where to look. Lord, we're grateful that we can find it in your word, that we can rest on your truth. Lord, so often in our lives we try to rely upon ourselves and our strengths and we, we, we realize how feeble we are. Lord, help us to always rest upon your word rest upon the truth, that we wouldn't be deceived by ourselves or, or the lies of Satan, those around us, Lord, that we always rest in you. And Lord, I pray if there's one who's here today that's never accepted you as Lord and Savior, they don't know that heaven is their home, they've never called upon your name, Lord, I pray that they'd make that decision today. If they'd like to talk, Lord, I pray that you'd help them to come to talk to myself, the pastor, or another um, loved brother uh, here, Lord, that they, we'd be able to show them who we are and how to be saved. And Lord, I pray for every believer who is here today, every man who is here, Lord, whether <coughs> young or 
looking to the future, looking, planning to uh, be married one day and have a family more. I pray that you uh, help them as they, they seek you and seek your will, Lord, that they follow you and put you as first place. And Lord, I pray that you be with every father and husband who's in this room as well, Lord, that you help us to not rely upon our own strength and our own guidance and leading, but that we follow your direction and your uh, divine providence and care that you show us, Lord. That you'd help us to be sensitive to the spiritual leading, and that we would always place our faith and trust in you. And we pray these things now in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. 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 Amen.